You mentioned getting a cognitive oscopy earlier. Can you tell us more about what it is? Where do you get it? What, uh, what does it do for you uh, if you're having cognitive decline? Yeah, and this is, you know, cognoscopy, uh, easy to do. It's three pieces, and you can actually go on mycognoscopy.com and you can get this directly. It's a set of blood tests that will look at what are your risk factors. It's um, a simple online cognitive assessment. So you're looking at, hey, you know, again, maybe things are a little worse than I thought they were. Again, this sneaks up on so many people and they're surprised to find, wow, you know, my, my uh, cognition is not as good as I thought it was. I really better get on uh, treatment now. And then the third part, um, it, which is an MRI with volumetrics. Like if you have, don't have any symptoms, you don't need to do the third part. If you do have symptoms, good idea to get an MRI with volumetrics. But whether or not you do that third part, please make sure to get the appropriate testing and the appropriate online cognitive assessment to see where you stand and to get on optimal either prevention or reversal as early as possible. Does meditation impact dementia? Yeah, you know, as a scientist, um, I really thought these things were silly years ago. I thought, you know, stuff like joy and, you know, and meditation. And this is all about molecules. It's all about science. But, you know, I have to say, I, I cannot deny the published data. Um, meditation clearly helps with neuroplasticity. It clearly helps with blood pressure, uh, clearly helps with depression, uh, a number of things, which is why people have done it over thousands of years. Um, whether you like uh, you know, transcendental meditation or you like mindfulness or what, what have you, um, then there's Kirtan Kriya that has been uh, pointed out. There's a lot of studies showing its improvement uh, with uh, cognition and improvement and, and reduction of risk for dementia. So, uh, or you like something else, these are all helpful. And this of course gets into uh, yoga as well. Uh, these again, all part of uh, improving outcomes uh, and improving neuroplasticity. Uh, so yeah, uh, meditation turns out to be something that as part of an overall program can be quite helpful. What studies have you done or read that has made you believe that Alzheimer's can be prevented, slowed or stopped? Yeah, because we've seen it. Uh, and I just got another email from one of the practitioners. Yes, we've now trained 1,750 practitioners from 10 different countries and all over the U.S. I hear from them, you know, various ones all the time uh, that they're seeing repeatedly people getting better and staying better. So uh, I've seen it with my own eyes and we've published it repeatedly. Uh, so I think there's little doubt at this point. Now, what we really, again, instead of arguing about can they, we really wanna be saying, okay, how can we do better? What about the ones who are uh, far advanced and aren't doing well? What can we add to make that better? Can we make, can we guarantee people that they will be better? What are the things that we can do? What about the non-Alzheimer's? What about frontotemporal dementia? And what about Lewy body? We've had good results with Lewy body disease. So far, a lot that we don't know about frontotemporal dementia, uh, which is much less common, but is another an important cause of dementia. So there's no question that you can see reversal of cognitive decline. We've seen it, we've documented it, we've published it repeatedly. Can stem cells help someone who already has Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think in the long run, stem cells will be important because when you think about it, you're doing three things. You're removing the causes of the decline. You're now improving resilience. You're optimizing all these factors, the hormones, the trophic factors, et cetera. But then you also want to rebuild what's been lost. And stem cells can be very powerful in the rebuilding part. They also can be powerful in, in supporting your immune function. Uh, immune abnormalities, uh, the critical role in COVID-19, critical role in Alzheimer's disease. We hear about cytokine storm uh, in, which is in, in COVID where you've got this uh, in, in the inflammatory part without enough adaptive part. Same thing happens in Alzheimer's, but in this case, it's over years. So it's really more of a cytokine dribble than it is a cytokine storm, but it, it contributes to it. But stem cells enhance your immune support, enhance your trophic support. Now, there are ongoing trials where they're using these as a monotherapy. My argument there is that it's a little bit like trying to rebuild a house as it's burning down. It really doesn't make a lot of scientific sense. So what you wanna do is put out the fire first, do all the right things, and then add the stem cells. And I think that there's going to be a big role for stem cells going forward. You've said over 400 Alzheimer's drugs have failed. Yes. How many have succeeded? So mainly two. So, and, and when, we, there, there's, when we say succeeded, 
they have a tiny, very tiny effect. Uh, and so the two that have succeeded, Aricept and Nemenda, and those are typically used. And then there are a few others that, that mimic Aricept. Uh, but these are very modest effects. Uh, and in fact, a statistician told me that uh, you could literally have said memantine either worked or didn't work. It was right on the border. And I should point out a couple of the antibodies, and in general, the antibodies have all failed, but a couple have been touted recently as being big successes. These did not improve anybody with Alzheimer's. They didn't stop the decline. They slowed the decline by about a third. So if you wanna call that success, okay, but it's not what we're looking for. We're looking for actually improving people. And that's what the overall protocol does. Again, I think there's gonna be a role for these antibodies in that after you've done everything else and improved someone, you wanna get rid of the existing amyloid that's been around for years. And I think these things can be helpful. If you get rid of that and do nothing else, you're simply removing an antimicrobial protectant. Should we take far red infrared saunas to remove toxins from our body? As again, uh, so many of us are exposed to toxins like never before. They're in the air we breathe, they're in the water we drink, and, you know, they're in our homes, they're just, they're everywhere. And so most of us have a very significant toxic burden. And those of us who don't have good detoxification apparatus that may have nulls in some of their glutathione related genes are gonna be at increased risk over the others. And they're gonna end up not realizing at the point until they get a cancer or they get cognitive decline or other problems. And so absolutely detoxification, we have, again, we have a whole section in the book about detoxification. We also have it in the, the guides uh, that, that, uh, that we use for people who are on the program. Uh, this is important. Um, and part of that is sweating. And part of that sauna is a good way to go exercise. And then you want to, you know, as, this, as you're sweating out some of these toxins, which does occur, you know, you want, you can eliminate them through your, you know, th through your colon, you're eliminating them uh, through, uh, you're eliminating through, through, uh, uh, through your urine, you're eliminating them through, uh, through sweating. All of these things are useful. And you want to obviously reduce your intake of these various toxins as well. Because again, it's a dynamic balance. If you're putting in a lot of them and you're not getting rid of a lot of them, you're in trouble. You want to put in fewer and get rid of more. And now you're in good shape. And so as part of that, a sauna can be very helpful and you want to follow up the sweating with a non-toxic soap like a Castile soap or one of those. Does too much screen time increase dementia? Yeah, indirectly it can. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a direct cause but yes, again, as part of an overall, it, it, it reduces your quality of sleep. So this is why, you know, at night when you're going to use this, use either blue blockers or use an appropriate program so that you don't have so much blue light. This can be damaging not only to your sleep, also damaging, by the way, to your retina, it increases your risk for macular degeneration, which has its own separate balance there. Uh, and one that we're now uh, attacking as well, looking at changing that balance, a separate biochemistry, but the same general idea. And so, yes, um, too much screen time. It also is associated with sedentary lifestyle. It also is associated with increased uh, stress. So, you know, appropriate time, be careful. Of course, we all spend the days on our computers and doing it, especially with the Zoom uh, meetings that we're all doing with the pandemic. Uh, it's important, it's an important thing, but it also important, get up. This is why everyone reminds you, you know, get up and move around at least once every hour. Uh, don't be sitting there uh, for too long. Sitting is, as they say, sitting's the new smoking. So uh, for all those reasons, yes, be careful about the overall amount of time and just remember that you wanna have exercise size as well. Does use of cell phones and the wireless radiation from them have any impact on dementia? Yeah, this is still a controversial area. And the answer is not in. You know, the jury's still out on this. We don't know. Um, there are some people that are absolutely convinced that things like Wi-Fi and cell phone exposure are damaging. And I think in the long run, when we have a better way to measure, this is the problem right now. We don't have a, a simple clinical lab test to say, aha, it's your cell phone that gave you this cognitive decline. But I won't be that surprised if it's one of the many contributors. Um, you know, again, we're all exposed to chemotoxins, biotoxins, and these physical toxins, EMFs and things like that, like never before. 
So this, what we really need right now is a simple lab test to show that, yes, that's one of the causes of your cognitive decline. So as we bring this to a close, why was it important for you to come speak here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? Yeah, you know, as someone who uh, spent my career uh, in academics, uh, to see that what we are doing in the clinic does not reflect what the, si the basic science is telling us. This is, of course, what we went through with COVID-19. People did all sorts of crazy things at times. And ultimately, we started realizing, okay, there are certain things that we need to do. And it does impact what you are doing, how you are living, what you're eating, what your vitamin D and zinc and all these things. I realized that there is a huge gap between what we see in the test tube and what we can actually see with this theory and with, with how this disease actually works and the way people are going about it. And I realized there are millions and millions of needless deaths. Unfortunately, this, this should be a rare disease. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, you know, this should be a past scourge instead of being the current pandemic it is. Alzheimer's will take the lives of about 45 million of the currently living Americans. We can do much, much better. And we should do much, much better, which is why I want to get the word out. So I think it's important for everyone to understand this, that for the first time, Alzheimer's is an option. You don't have to get it. Start early, do the right things. You can really give yourself a very, very low risk. You can reduce your risk to almost zero if you do the right things. Well, we thank you for joining us. And, and again, for all of your meaningful work. Sharing it with our audience, very, very important. Um, Absolutely. With that, uh, thank you so much. We'll see you at the conference. All right, great to talk to you. Thanks very much. Take care, be well. Stay safe. Okay, bye-bye.